tell. Today's verses from Romans are actually going to be six through, well, the rest of the chapter. And I'll dig into why at the end. So let's get started. Verse six. David confirms this way of looking at it, saying that the one who trusts God to do the putting everything right without insisting on having a say in it is one fortunate man. Fortunate those whose crimes are whisked away, whose sins are wiped clean from the slate. Fortunate the person against whom the Lord does not keep score. Do you think for a minute that this blessing is only pronounced over those who keep our religious ways and are circumcised? Or do you think it is possible that the blessing could be given to those who never even heard of our ways? Who were never brought up in the disciplines of God? We all agree, don't we, that it was by embracing what God did for him that Abraham was declared fit before God? Now think, was that declaration made before or after he was marked by the covenant rite of circumcision? That's right, before he was marked. That means that he underwent circumcision as evidence and confirmation of what God was doing long before or to bring him into this acceptable standing with himself, an act of God he embraced with his whole life. And it means further that Abraham is father of all people who embrace what God does for them while they are still on the outs with God. As yet unidentified as gods, in an uncircumcised condition, it is precisely these people in this condition who are called set right by God and with God. Abraham is also, of course, father of those who have undergone the religious side of circumcision, not just because of the ritual, but because they are willing to live the risky faith embrace of God's action for them, the way Abraham lived long before he was marked by circumcision. That famous promise God gave Abraham, that he and his children would possess the earth, was not given because of something Abraham did or would do. It was based on God's decision to put everything together for him, which Abraham then entered when he believed. If those who get what God gives them uh, if those who get what God gives them only get it by doing everything they are told to do and filling out the right forms properly signed, that eliminates personal trust completely and turns the promise into an ironclad contract. That's not a holy promise. That's a business deal. A contract drawn up by, hard -nosed, by a hard-nosed lawyer and with plenty of fine print only makes sure that you will never be able to collect. But if there is no contract in the first place, simply a promise, and God's promise at that, you can't break it. This is why the fulfillment of God's promises depends entirely on trusting God and His way, and then simply embracing Him to do what He does. God's promise arrives as pure gift. That's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Those who keep the religious traditions and those who have never heard of them. For Abraham is father to us all. He is not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. He's our faith father. We call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many people. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do, raise the dead to life. With a word, make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, decided to live, uh, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do and so was made father of a multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, you're going to have a big, fam a big family, Abraham. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say, it's hopeless, this hundred-year-old body could never father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God prom God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God. Sure that God would make good of what he said. That's why it is said Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. But it's not just Abraham. It's also us. The same thing gets said to us when we embrace and believe the one who brought Jesus to life, 
when the conditions were equally hopeless. The sacrifice Jesus made us fit for God, set us right with God. And the reason I wanted to finish these verses, off, uh, this chapter off in one go, is because this story of Abraham, you know, it's a very rich story, and it has a lot of rise and fall, and it has a lot of reflection of the human condition. So I want to spend the next couple of days, instead of taking them to read the verse by verse that I would do, I want to take the next couple of days and actually read the story of Abraham from his birth to his death. And I want to do that because all of this paints Abraham as an incredible person. And he was in his faith, in his trusting the Lord. He didn't get it perfect in one go. And that means there's hope for us too. So for the next couple of days, probably about the next six, I'm going to be digging into the story of Abraham, which is chapters... Um, I wrote it down, actually, in the previous verse. I think it's um, 11 through 25. And we're going to go in and do the entire thing. Because in Romans, Paul says that Abraham is declared righteous by faith. And I want to dig into what that story looks like, what that journey looks like. Because Abraham didn't get it right in one. We don't either. And yet Abraham was still declared righteous by faith. We are too. So I want to dig into the human condition more there. See you guys tomorrow with the start of Abraham's story. <laughs>